our next speaker uh, is following a tradition. Many of you know that C. Everett Koop uh, had the first Surgeon General's workshop, and we celebrated 25 years of his uh, first workshop in Rochester, New York, of course, um, and we have had the help of Surgeon Generals since that time. Most recently, Regina Benjamin, who provided us with the health goals and a, and a roadmap for supporting breastfeeding and increasing breastfeeding. But today, it's my honor to introduce to you our acting Surgeon General. And acting is probably a good term because he's full of action. And Rear Admiral uh, Boris Lushniak is serving as Acting Surgeon General today. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about him. As is in, in medical tradition, we always like to know where people came from. And he was born in Chicago, post-World War II immigrant from the Ukraine. He was admitted to the six-year honor program in medical education in Northwestern University and completed his Bachelor of Science in 81, obtained his medical degree in 83, got a master's in public health in 84 at Harvard, and in 87, he completed his family medicine residency. From that time, he has worked in the field of public health and if I were to tell you all the interesting and exciting places he's been, it wouldn't be time for his lecture. But I would like to say that he has been at the front line in, in many a disaster. <coughs> Bangladesh, St. Croix, Russia, Kosovo, part of the team at Ground Zero at the World Trade Center, and investigating the anthrax attacks in Washington, D.C. Now, this doesn't begin to describe his career, but I'd like to hear, have you hear from him. Surgeon General, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence. I'm going to get mic'd up here for a second because I have a terrible allergy to podiums. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for the shortened version. You know, every time I hear the long version of it, first of all, it does eat into my time. Uh, but, but also, I always think to myself, oh my God, I feel so old. Uh, because as you go through a rendition of one's life, you kind of think to yourself, well, yeah, I kind of remember doing that. I remember being there. But, but in essence, being here is actually what's important right now. Um, and and it certainly, I'd like to thank the organizers for asking the Office of Surgeon General to be present. Why? Because this issue is so darn important. And it's an issue that keeps coming up. It's an issue that we need to keep growing into. And I love the way it was put earlier, right? The concept that somehow we are growing back to where we once were. Now, I'm going to have several themes this morning, and amongst the themes I want to start off with is the concept of success in public health. I always keep saying that in public health, first and foremost, what is our role? And I take on the concept, it deals with, with health issues. And, and I go back to the basics of the World Health Organization definition of health. That definition states, and you're going to get, if you've not heard this, before, you will be overwhelmed with the responsibility that falls on our shoulders. If all of you are related to the health field or are passionate about health, health of women, health of infants, health of our society, this definition covers it all. And the definition starts off by saying what? It says that health is the complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And, and realize that a lot of our society in the last century plus has really focused not necessarily on the concept of health. We have focused so well as a nation, put so many of our resources into the concept of what? Of illness, of sickness. 
and, and some people would surmise, you know, we come up with that very basic question, do we have a great health care system in this country? Not really. What we have is a wonderful, expensive, but wonderful sick care system. And in essence, when we look at that, the, that concept of public health, that concept of now to saying, okay, we have health as a definition by the World Health Organization, and then we delve into the concept of public health, which is now the health of that society, the health of populations. We now introduce the concept in public health of the partnerships, and the partnerships that in fact exist in this room, which is, guess what, folks? We're now bold enough to say that the feds, people in this uniform, we can't do it all. You know, maybe there was an era where we can say, oh, you know, give it us, we'll do it. You know, the feds will. The reality is that when you look at the definition of public health, which is the health of populations, intertwined in that is what? Is the concept of this now is everybody's game, right? This includes leadership at all levels. It includes partnerships at all levels. It includes all facets of our society to be able to attain that public health vision. We look at the successes of public health and you know sometimes when I have my slide set around and, and this time I didn't want to you know it's sometimes freer when you're freer of PowerPoints right I'm sorry for the AV crew I didn't give you anything to do today other than direct me but I always say at this point let's give a hand of a, a round of applause for the AV crew who document this and who never get acclaims right they're always in the background but thank you so much for being here but when I go through the slide set and we talk about, uh, and I would focus on this, look back in 1999, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and look specifically at an article that dealt with the 10 major public health accomplishments of the 20th century, 1900 to 1999. Maternal health does come up in it, I believe. There's other issues that come up in it. But in essence, what we have is we show that in essence, over a hundred years, we had incredible public health progress. And in some circumstances, it was an evolution even of technology and problem description and resolution. For example, motor vehicle safety is listed on there. And you realize in the year 1900, there were barely any cars around. So we're talking about not only this inception of a technology, but the ability to mass produce that technology, Henry Ford, the ability to use that technology throughout the nation, Eisenhower and the interstate system, and then ultimately a problem developing, oh my God, people are dying, people are getting injured, and oh my God, we, the big public health, has to do something about it. With partnerships with engineering, partnerships with others, partnerships with the industry, we come up ultimately by 1999 not something that is so completely self, self, safe that no one dies or is maimed, but in essence a pathway of resolution. And yet notice in that hundred years, if we talk about breastfeeding, breastfeeding is not on that list of accomplishments in the hundred years. And in fact what we did in those hundred years is in fact regressed as opposed to progressed Multiple reasons for that. You yourselves have probably discussed it multiple times. The changing of society, the changing of social norms, the expectation of women. Yes, let's, I dare say, the power of an industry that's out there selling a product. We've seen all this before. So I move to my second theme, which is we look at public health. First and foremost, we have the ability to progress. And we're on that pathway. I need to remind you that in public health, there is no place, no place for pessimists, right? If you're a pessimist, you don't fit into the public health. Now, you're, you're going to go crazy, right? You're going to be so distressed, you, you have to choose a different career path. So first and foremost, I present to you an optimism that although breastfeeding is not listed on that 10 best accomplishments of a whole century that I propose to you that we working together shoot for the idea that perhaps at the 50 year mark of the 21st century CDC comes out with a list and says what has been the major progress in public health and breastfeeding stands as number one on that list. 
right? The concept that we have a goal, we have the ability to change and turn things around. Let's talk about anniversary years. We talked about C. Everett Koop, right? 1984, a Surgeon General's workshop on this issue. You know, I'm acting Surgeon General. I'll tell you the truth. What's fantastic about this position? What's fantastic about this position is we have a legacy of incredible leaderships. I'm honored and humbled to be here as the acting. I'm a simple guy from Chicago, right? Pinch me, Dr. Lawrence, because I am the acting Surgeon General of the United States at this point in time. I've been riding a career wave. And yet I stand, as we always hear, on the shoulders of incredible leaders of the past. I represent a uniform service of the United States. This is not a uniform just given to the Surgeon General. Oh, parade around, it makes you look fancy, it fits the name Surgeon General. But in fact, it's the, 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 the uniform of the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. 125 years this year as a uniform service led for all those years by Surgeons General. 1984, Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, the lion of Surgeons General. In fact, if you poll the audience who are old enough, that's the last Surgeon General anyone remembers in the general population survey. 1984, amongst all the other issues, and mind you, this is just a year into his term as Surgeon General of the United States, takes on this issue has this workshop. We're now in the 30-year mark. So we look back at leadership like that, who back 30 years ago said, OK, in this position, and, and the secret I'm going to tell you is, guess what? There's two components to being Surgeon General of the United States, two components, right? It's, I'm a very simple guy. I put things into boxes. Box number one is leading the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. Lieutenant Chica here is one of our stellar officers. I have 6,900 such stellar officers stationed in 800 locations worldwide, serving 26 different departments and agencies of the US government. I am proud of them and the work they do for the good of our country with a mission of being here to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. If one believes in conspiracy theories, what is this unknown service that's infiltrated 26 different departments and agencies of the US government under the leadership of a single person, this is conspiracy theory. This is we have infiltrated the highest levels of the US government. Mm -hmm. But it's all for good, right? That's the good thing about it. It's all for making sure we move ahead in public health. My tie-in with C. Everett Koop is he's the one who commissioned me. And so when I look back at anniversaries, this being a 30th of that workshop, I was a young lieutenant a few years after that first workshop coming in. I still have my commissioning papers signed by C. Everett Koop, signed and dated July 4th, 1988. Years later, I would turn to him and say, Dr. Koop, you signed my commissioning papers. You must have been the only federal worker at work that day, because it was July 4th. Everybody's watching fireworks. He's sitting at his desk stamping my commissioning. He'd always turn to me and said, Morris, frankly, I never remember signing those things. Then we move ahead. I was looking at, and I love the way you've put together this book today, right, the, the, the program book. I love the fact that you have the agendas of the five previous. Because, you know, sometimes we forget to look back. And we always think to ourselves, OK, so who was there? What's been happening? What did we discuss? Well, at the first, there was actually an acting Surgeon General here. It was Stephen Galson who I met my first day on the job back in Cincinnati. We were stationed at CDC NIOSH. He ultimately became acting Surgeon General, and he's the guy speaking here at the first such conference. Then I go back a little further in terms of connectivity. Well, Regina Benjamin, Dr. Regina Benjamin, hired me to be her deputy. And in fact, one of the first events I was at as a much younger, a much less stressed, person was, in fact, coming to the release of the call to action on breastfeeding. And feeling overwhelmed at that event, first of all, by your participation, by the enthusiasm in the room, but also being reminded at that point of really what the job of the Surgeon General is. I keep hinting at the secret is that, you know, I have that Commission core component, and I also have 
the other component, which one can surmise as being what? The nation's doctor, just the way we like to put it, the bully pulpit. It's the ability for having a person to be able to come out and say, here's an issue we need to deal with from a public health perspective. Here's where we think we should be going. The secret I'm I've been sort of holding back on you is, guess what? I don't have very much money. And guess what? I don't have a huge research staff. And guess what? There ain't too much behind that office of the Surgeon General in terms of money, personnel, research opportunities. But what I have, and that you can't take away, unless, of course, they decided to fire me soon, is in the ability to speak out. The ability to, yes, in a captivating uniform, but with some sense of authority saying, nation, here's a problem. This year we have an anniversary, or 50th anniversary of Luther Terry's first report on smoking. We grasp that and we say, we have a problem. We did that 50 years ago. A Surgeon General's report comes out with a simple statement. It's a big report. It basically, for the first time, came out and said, hey, you know, we in this panel are saying this is bad for you. Simple statement said, the conclusion of the report was, cigarette smoking is a significant hazard in the United States to warrant appropriate remedial action. And then that subtlety, in those subtle words, 50 years of activism started. And in fact, I was captivated by the video uh, before this, which showed us a nader in breastfeeding. And the actions taken place, and as things turn around, it's incredible the analogies we have with cigarette smoking. Because what I have is I have a 50-year mark that I can see progress, where in fact it's the opposite. Because we want things to head in the opposite direction with cigarette smoking. We want it to go down to zero. While with breastfeeding, we're shooting for 100%. But it's the ability for, once again, the Surgeon General to play a role. And again, I'm not naive or bold enough to say, oh, it all depends on us. We are but partners to you. We are but part of the formula. But what Dr. Koop had done, what Dr. Satcher had done, what Dr. Benjamin had done, I guarantee you that this acting who views, sometimes people view acting, you know, nobody likes that adjective. Right? Oh, you're acting, which means what? You're just sitting around holding a place until the real person shows up. Right? My staff knows that I believe in the premise that acting, the first three letters are ACT, act, which means do. We take that legacy of previous surgeons. I take that legacy of my previous boss, Dr. Benjamin, and I recommit to you that the Surgeon General supports breastfeeding, that we need to continue to pursue it in a path forward to achieve what is best, that's first food. And the reality that this is the essential role. That can't be denied. So we rededicate ourselves in this anniversary year. Last year, Captain Larry Grummer Strawn, actually Larry and I also go back many years, us in uniform, we sort of, we're like a gang, like a street gang, you know, but a street gang for good, spoke about some of the numbers. I'm not here to talk about numbers. What I'm here to talk about is at least some aspect of successes from a federal perspective. He had the numbers, but we realized there are still many barriers in the way. So last week, CDC, in the Journal of Human Lactation showed us yet another study of barriers, right? The idea that work, guess what? Working women, work gets in the way. And we really have to look at our whole world of policies regarding return to work issues and making sure those workplaces are friendly, friendlier, encouraging for women to continue breastfeeding. Because when we look at this, you know, we really do have those three components in which you are all aware, uh, well versed, right? It's initiation, it's exclusivity, and duration. So how do you start? How do you keep it up as the only source for those key components of a baby's growth? And how do you keep it on for a long time? And yet that report showed us what? Showed us that, you know, it's kind of around the 12-week mark, right? If you return before 12 weeks, ladies, this doesn't seem to work. 
If it's longer, well, we have a chance. If you're a full-time person, you know, so we have barriers that we have to acknowledge in those workplaces. The disparity issue. I know tomorrow there'll be a separate panel on disparities. We have to reconcile the fact that, you know, we look at certain communities out there, as you already stated, is that we're behind. You know, the analogy once again goes to smoking. I have an opposite problem in the smoking world. I have people ahead and I don't want them to be. What we do have is we have a recognition now that the disparities exist and using 21st century communication. The concept here is how do we deal with this problem? I'll bring up the issue of, you know, or not the issue, but one of the programs that we run right now, right? It's part of the Affordable Care Act. It's a national prevention strategy. It's set up in that act to really change the focus of a nation from one on sickness and illness to one on health and wellness, on prevention. In that realm, we lo really look at pillars and we recognize one of the pillars, one of the things we have to break through are the disparities issues. But the second one is almost just as important and it really falls in great with breastfeeding decisions. And that's the concept of empowered people. The reality of the situation is how do we break through disparities? How do we break through decision making in general? A and we are a nation that loves its freedom. You know, and we've tried this in the past, right? Don't smoke. Well, I'm an American. I'll decide whether I smoke or not. Do breastfeed. Uh, I'm a liberated person. I'm, I'll make my decisions. And the concept of empowering is not to basically say you will do this. The concept of empowering is utilizing those incredible facets of us as freedom-loving people to be able to have that health literacy component fully blossoming, to be able to get information from people like you in your work, people like me in my work, and to be able to say, here's all the information. Now make the choice. Empowerment means that we strive for a person to make the right choice, and the right choice for breastfeeding as well. And that's embedded within our national prevention strategy. It is an important tenant to this. Certainly, we look at the Affordable Care Act, and, I, and I'm so glad you put in, again, in you know, this, this gold mine of a, 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 a short but sweet agenda on steroids. Because what you have in there, you have important components of the Affordable Care Act that I think you'll be talking about shortly, which is, you know, in the act is our preventive services that include lactation counseling, includes breast pumps embedded in that. That's a step forward. Right, where we have an important reform movement when it comes to health care in this country and prevention in this country and a rededication to say this is important. That's so key. So we had this call to action back in 2011. What transpires from that? Do we just walk away? We issue a report saying, oh, Dr. Benjamin, your job is done. No, the baton is handed to an acting surgeon general. At some point, the 19th Surgeon General will be nominated and ultimately confirmed by the Senate. When that's going to be, I don't know. But when that moment happens, the legacy then gets passed on to that person. We don't drop an issue as important as breastfeeding. We continue on that support of this. But in essence, what do we do? You know, again, I didn't put a ton of staff behind this. I didn't put a ton of money. The call to action is exactly that, is the Surgeon General and the Office of the Surgeon General, working in conjunction with our partners, guess what? We don't really write the reports either. We certainly know that the partnerships are out there, but that's the beauty of our partnerships. And at the end of the day, it's there to inspire others to say, oh, that's important that these people think it's important. So therefore, let's do something about it. So we have call to action droppings that occur. But dropping is in a good sort of way, right? I mean, in, in the physical world, and I don't mean to be sort of in that strange analogy, but in essence, a dropping is leftovers that have been processed. So give me a little bit of, of space here to be able to develop this concept. And in many cases, in the animal world, those dropping contain seeds. So it's information, it's important things, it's nutrition that has been processed and yet, ultimately, 
they can lead to seedlings sprouting up all over. The seedlings include aspects of so many different programs, many of them you've been involved with. The CDC's Guide to Strategies to Support Breastfeeding Mothers and Babies, an important component, right, looking at the important role of policy in all this. CDC, as a result, also continues to fund, and funding is always an issue. We're not all filled with money anymore, folks. The fiscal constraints exist, and guess who gets the big shaft usually when we get into fiscal constraints? It is public health at our public health initiatives. But certainly we try to continue to fund at higher enough levels state health departments to support breastfeeding and maternity care quality improvement. Various federal and non-federal agencies right, have worked on the Women's Health Camp or with the Office of Women's Health have worked on the campaign It's Only Natural, Mother's Love, Mother's Milk. National Institute for Children's Health Quality has a cooperative agreement with the CDC close par partnership with the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative has been leading the Best Fed Beginnings program. This is important. These are all those seedlings that come from the partnerships that perhaps are inspired by a call to action. Within the National Prevention Strategy, our partners are there. The concept, the importance of breastfeeding is included in the National Prevention Strategy. That's important. Because once again, if I'm taking that focus, focus from sickness and illness to one of health and wellness, this is a key feature of that. We look at what the Department of Defense is doing, implementing initiatives in medical facilities that encourage military beneficiaries to breastfeed infants through six months. These are steps forward. Our own Commission core last year and is still developing further policies for our own officers in uniform. Right? How do we encourage that? If the Surgeon General is out there saying do it, how dare my service not be actually leading in some of those policies and initiatives? Department of Labor, again, in our partnerships within the National Prevention Council, administering Section 6 of the Fair Lab Labor Standards, ensuring that female employees of covered employers have that reasonable break time, to have the facilities that are out there. Indian Health Service, and it's Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, a key partner in all this. So you can see how this call to action catalyzes, is an important step. And what we need to do at the sixth annual summit is re-inspire ourselves to do even more. And whether it's under the flag of the call to action, whether it's under the flag of the national prevention strategy, whether it's under the flag of just the concept of breastfeeding, I don't care. I don't have an ego to say this is all about us in the Surgeon General's office. What it is, is it's all about us in this room. It's all about us as individuals. It's all about us as families. It's all about us as communities. And then ultimately, that has its repercussions on the health and wellness of the nation. So what you're beginning here over the next two days is yet another start, is a yet another path forward on this important initiative. And yes, the numbers are turning, or we're getting encouraging, but we don't stop. I go back to the smoking analogy. You know, if people say you've already issued 32 reports on smoking in 50 years, and we're down to 18% of our population smoking, stop, you're doing okay. Why are you wasting more of our time? If I accepted that, that allows 480,000 people to die every year from smoking-related diseases. That's good enough? If I just allow it, that's 289 billion of direct and indirect costs related to tobacco use. Is that good enough? If I just sort of let things lie, saying, hey, we've done enough, that's 5.6 million kids, one out of every 13 children now living under the age of 18 who will die prematurely from smoking. Is that good enough? We have to take that same passion, that same sense of dedication to breastfeeding. You know, are the numbers now good enough? They aren't. Are they trending? Are they looking? Yeah, in some circumstances they are. But we know we can do better. One of the things I want to unveil in closing here, and I think we're going to be ready to go with the video, is in fact just a short, soon to be released initiative that's developed by the Department of Health and Human Services and our Office of Women's Health. 
and this really goes into the concept of workplaces and difficult workplaces. How do we inspire those difficult workplaces to really begin looking at breastfeeding as an important facet of their employees' health and of our nation's health? Can we roll that video? <laughs> 